I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. First up is going, we're going to be ta talking with Farron Savage, uh, Penn Environment's Zero Waste Initiative Coordinator, and he is in charge of the plastic bag bans across the state. He's so doing a wonderful job, and he's going to report what has been going on with that. Then we're going to have Kara Rash from Easttown Environmental Advisory Council. She will talk about the work done there in Easttown. And then Zach Davis of Upper Marion EAC is going to talk about the King of Prussia Mall and the plastic bag band there. We also have Ashley Gange from uh, West Goshen. She's a supervisor. She's going to make some comments. And we have several other EAC members that may want to comment. But basically, I'm hoping that we're going to get um, people that are working on plastic bag bands to ask questions. And we have plenty of uh, experts on the um, topic. So I'm going to take it over to Farron, if you'd like to speak. Sure thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming out tonight. My name's Farron. I'm the Zero Waste Advocate with Penn Environment. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we're a statewide environmental nonprofit. We work to make sure all Pennsylvanians have clean air, clean water, and a safe and livable environment. Um, at Penn Environment, we've really been working for the past several years with townships, with boroughs, with cities, um, local leaders across Pennsylvania to tackle plastic pollution and litter. Um, I'll talk a bit about why we're doing that um, and some of the background of the problem what progress we've made, and then um, a bit about what some of the best policies are. And then for the Q&A, I can go into more specifics about resources. Um, but really, we've spent the past few years tackling this problem because we just generate so much waste, and so much of the waste we create is plastic. Um, every year, Americans create about 35 million tons of plastic waste, but less than 6% gets recycled. The rest ends up in a landfill, it ends up incinerated, or it goes directly to our environment. And that's a problem um, because I'm sure we've all seen photos of birds wrapped in plastic bags, turtles with straws up their noses. Mm -hmm. Plastic in our environment, it chokes wildlife, it can harm them directly, cuts off their airways, it impacts their ability to find food, it can impact migration and breeding patterns, it has a whole host of ecological effects. But it's not just wildlife we need to worry about. We use so many single-use plastics in so many part of our parts of our lives, and often for just a few minutes, that they're sort of pervading everything we do. When we throw away plastic, it doesn't really go away. Whether it ends up in a landfill or an incinerator or in our environment, that plastic is going to cause harm to us and our environment. And that's because plastic doesn't biodegrade. It breaks into these tinier and tinier pieces of plastic called microplastics. Our research at Penn Environment has found them in over 100 rivers, lakes, and streams all around Pennsylvania, including 50 of the cleanest, most ecologically important streams in the state. And these are the places where we get drinking water from. It's places where we fish or boat, hike, where kids play. This isn't so much an ocean problem as it is a local problem. This plastic is affecting us right here at home. Microplastics have also been found in our air, our food, our water. Some studies suggest that every week, humans ingest five grams of plastic just from living our lives. And that's about the weight of a single-use plastic bag. So if you think about it, every week we're eating, breathing, and drinking a single-use plastic bag. And that has an impact on human health. It impacts the health of our wildlife. It has ripple effects. And I won't go into that now, but we can talk about that more in the Q&A. And since these plastics are really everywhere and they never truly go away, the best thing we can do is to stop using them. If we turn off the tap of plastic, stop the flow into our lives, then we can stop the flow into the environment. And we strongly recommend doing that through bans and other restrictions on single-use plastic products, like the bags given out at retail locations, polystyrene foam containers, what we normally think of as styrofoam, restrictions on plastic straws or utensils. These policies have been done effectively in thousands of municipalities and in 10 states all across the country. Unfortunately, in Pennsylvania, we're sort of lagging behind a lot of our neighbors. And so it's really on our local communities to step up and take action. And that's fitting because our municipalities are the ones who deal with trash and recycling. They deal with litter. They keep parks and streets clean. 
Plastic especially is hard to recycle. Items like plastic bags make it hard to recycle other items and make it more expensive by clogging sorting equipment, by hurting the infrastructure. They clog storm drains, which makes flooding and heavy rainfall worse, another hugely local problem. It plagues our lives in all these different ways that are acutely felt at the local level. And so it makes sense that we tackle this in our boroughs, in our townships, in our cities. So that's why we've been working um, to pass bans on items like plastic bags. To date, 15 municipalities all across the Commonwealth have passed restrictions on single-use plastic bags, including our two largest cities, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Um, all told, these laws cover about 16% of the population. When they're all in effect, they could eliminate over 780 million single-use plastic bags. That's 4,300 tons of plastic every year which is just a ton of waste or literally tons of waste that would otherwise end up incinerated, it would end up in a landfill or littered in our environment. So these are concrete steps we can take and that we are taking. And I think the momentum for this type sort of action has really shifted recently. We're seeing more leaders step up now than ever before, um, especially in the wake of the statewide preemption, the ban on local plastic bag bans ending at the end of 2021. In 2022, um, 11 Pennsylvania municipalities passed local ordinances banning plastic bags, and in some cases, other types of single-use plastics. We saw the first ban on polystyrene. We also saw the second, third, and fourth bans on polystyrene. All of those passed. We saw restrictions on straws and utensils. So it's really great to see all these cities, these townships, these boroughs taking on single-use plastic waste, but we do need more action. So we're encouraging as many municipalities as we can to step up and pass a plastic bag ban. It's a great first step. It's effective. It's been done before. We have readily available alternatives, both with paper bags and especially with reusable bags. So at Penn Environment, we've developed a set of resources, including model legislation. There's an online toolkit that will send a link around to everyone to help in this process. Um, and we've developed these models based on best practices all across the country. I mentioned before, Pennsylvania is lagging behind. That's somewhat a good thing in this regard because we can see what's gone well for everyone else. We can see what hasn't worked. And so we can do the best things for our cities, for our boroughs and our towns. And a crucial point from that I wanna stress is that these laws aren't just about getting rid of plastic. They're about encouraging people to use and find reusable alternatives, which are the best option for our environment. Plastic is the worst option, which is why we recommend a ban but paper bags are still single use, so they still become waste. They have a footprint in terms of energy and material to create. Um, and so we recommend pairing a ban on plastic with a small fee of around 15 cents on other bags provided by a retailer. Shoppers are encouraged to bring their own bag from home. It's a small charge, but it's an effective reminder and incentive. Because if you think about it, if you go to the store and you have to pay 30 cents for two paper bags, 45 for a third one, then you're gonna think, oh, I'll just make sure to have reusable bags every time I go to the store. And that has ripple effects all of its own. Um, it can sort of lead to changes in other parts of your lives. It can lead to a mentality shift. Because if you're used to having reusable bags available to, to you, stashing them in a bag, a backpack, a car, next to your door when you leave, you get used to having other types of reusables all around you as well. A reusable water bottle instead of a plastic one bringing a reusable mug or a thermos to the coffee shop, having a metal straw or reusable takeout containers. Plastic bag bans are, are great first steps, not just for the immediate tangible impact, but for these mentality changes that they can create. Um, a few other key components in our model plastic bag ban that I wanna just mention here. In our definitions, we wanted to make sure that these types of laws apply to as many types of retail as possible. So it's not just grocery stores a plastic bag ban would impact. It includes convenience stores, restaurants, gas stations, clothing stores, farmers markets, and so much more. The broader you can apply this type of policy, the better it's going to be because the more people it's going to impact and the more changes we can create. Through our definitions, we also want to make sure that uh, all types of plastic bags are covered. It doesn't matter how thick or thin that plastic bag is, it's still a single-use plastic bag, and so we want them banned. If it's made from a bioplastic or a compostable plastic, it's a single-use plastic bag. It takes a lot of energy and material to create, 
and it's going to become waste once you use it for just a couple of minutes. And so when it comes down to it, these should all be banned. Um, and we should encourage the use of the better reusable, more sustainable alternatives. Um, and then I want to highlight education because uh, I know a lot of people always ask about how do we how do we do this? How do we educate our retailers? These aren't laws that are going to happen overnight. It's not like an ordinance passes and the next day every retailer has to stop using plastic bags. It's an adjustment. So in our model, we recommend a sort of three month runway after an ordinance passes, but before it goes into effect. And you can extend that. A lot of places have done six months. A few have gone to a year. You don't want to go too long, but it is flexible. And that gives you time for education, for retailers to switch to compliant bags, post signs, letting their customers know about impending changes. And it gives time for information to go up on a municipal website, like an FAQ, getting sample signs on the website, or other info. And a lot of that already exists. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. I know East Town has some great resources. Philadelphia has resources. Pittsburgh's creating resources. So these are places that have already passed. Um, so you can just modify them to fit your own needs. And I've been talking for a while, um, and I can certainly touch on more parts of our model, of our toolkit, other resources we have in the Q&A, but I do want to stress this. Legislation to tackle plastic bag pollution is supported by a ton of Pennsylvanians. It's been supported by a ton of businesses, both chains and small businesses all around the state. It's a concrete step. It has measurable effects that we know we can take to help our environment. We know that if we dramatically reduce the distribution of single-use plastics, we dramatically reduce the pollution going into our environment and our lives. That goes for plastic bags. It goes for other types of single-use plastics. I can talk about that as well, but um, I'm gonna leave that there and hand it back to Kathy. Uh, Kara, I think you're up next. Okay. Um, Sam, do you mind sharing my slides for me? Yeah, give me just one sec to get up. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Um, thanks, everyone. My name is Kara Rash. I am the chair of the East Town Township Environmental Advisory Council, and we recently passed a single use plastic bag ban. Um, last June, and it went into effect on January 1st of this year. And I'm just going to walk you through the process from initially thinking about it to um, getting it enacted and, you know, the implementation strategies that worked for us. And again, welcome questions at the end. Um, this is just, you know, a resource share for everybody. All right, next slide. Um, for those who don't know where East Town Township is, we're located in southeastern Pennsylvania. We're at the far eastern corner of Chester County. We are a small but lively community of 11,000 people. We do share a school district with two different township, which is three times our size. And we do have a robust business district of small mom and pop businesses along Route 30, Lancaster Avenue, for those who know. Um, we do not have any big box re retailers or grocery stores in East Town. We have a CVS, but that is it. So we had to uh, take that into consideration in collecting data about our businesses and then how we rolled this out to them. Next slide. A couple of facts about our plastic ordinance. Like I said, it went into effect on January 1st of this year. It is pretty straightforward. We only are working on single-use plastic carryout bags right now. In all businesses, like Farron was saying, we are trying to reach all commercial establishments with limited exceptions. Uh, if you want an exemption to the bag ban, you have one year, and you need to submit it in writing to our Board of super Supervisors. As of yet, we have not received one. Uh, we do use a plastic definition that is based on the production strategy. This is per Penn Environment's recommendation. That is a blown film extrusion process and does apply to plastics of all thicknesses and um, types so that we don't get anyone trying to skirt the rule with a thicker single use plastic bag, but is still plastic. Our paper bag definition is a 40% post-consumer recycled content bag that is also compostable, including the handles. 
Um, the handles sometimes are not always compostable. So that was an important thing for us to add. And again, per Penn Environment's recommendation, we do have a 15, per, uh, 15 cent uh, fee per paper bag that is kept by the business owners and is hopefully encouraging people to bring their own bag or forgo a bag completely. Next slide, please. So this is an overview, a timeline of our um, of how this happened in East Town. We as an EAC were formed in January of 2021. For those who don't have an EAC or a sustainability committee, um, that's something else to look into. It's a group that is a municipal advisory group uh, for all things in environmental. Um, and we, when we were formed, we knew that we had uh, support to pursue, you know, education and policy uh, for the township. Quickly after being uh, set up, we were approached by a local community group, the TE Green Team, about some survey data they had regarding residents' feelings towards single-use plastic bags that they had collected in April of 2020 that was overwhelmingly in favor of policy change for single-use plastic bags. So that was brought to our attention, and then we started talking about it uh, internally. Uh, we did present that to our Board of Supervisors and then had to create a survey for businesses, which we conducted um, a lot of presentations back and forth to the EAC and then the Board of Supervisors before getting this uh, passed unanimously in June of 22. And then again, it went into effect last month. Next slide. So the first thing, if you want to do this, is you need to take the pulse of your community. Um, who who's interested in this? Is it is it a group within the community? Is it a municipal leader, a major stakeholder in the community? Um, I've seen just in talking to other communities, this starts with a group of students. Some businesses have actually put it forward. A nonprofit group. You need someone to help drive the change and you have to have a willing group of people that are going to help not only do the data collection and analysis, but write the ordinance and then help present it to the community. Um, it is not a small feat, so um, you definitely want to have at least a couple people that are willing to take this on. A couple things that helped us in Easttown get this through was again that data collection from the TE Green Team for residents. Um, that was a huge piece of evidence we had in favor of pursuing this. We did get approached by Penn Environment and Farron um, regarding the campaign to further plastic ordinances across the state. And then something that was specific to Easttown was we were approached by the Chester County Solid Waste Authority with a uh, zero waste grant opportunity they had for municipalities pursuing um, projects that were related to lessening waste. And after a few conversations with them, they were they were supportive of us um, submitting an application for things pertaining to the ordinance passage. Next slide. So like I said, we did have a residential survey on hand. And as you can see, um, we did have a lot of support uh, for this. I think it was overwhelming. It was like 87% of uh, residents were in, in favor of some sort of ordinance banning plastics. Uh, for businesses, we did have to come up with something. We pulled surveys from all over the world um, and came together and came up with, I believe, a 12-question survey um, about how plastics are used in businesses, um, what the alternatives are, if they're aware of them, are they cost effective, what any barriers to entry exist, mm -hmm. and then what kind of policies they would support. And we provided a bunch, including ones that, you know, we were not really hoping to enact, but, um, you know, we wanted to see where people fell. And we had over 50% of businesses supportive of an ordinance specifically. Um, if you do have to conduct a survey you definitely want to think about the timing of it and then how you're going to get it out to, to people. So we were able to uh, collect survey data in person um, with two, myself and then another EAC member, two community volunteers over a number of weeks. Um, we did it in October. 
Uh, we had the survey ready in August, but we didn't want to do it then because everyone was on vacation. A lot of businesses are actually are closed around us for a couple of weeks in August. And then we were really sensitive to get it done before the winter holidays. So we wrapped things up in the first week of November um, and we provided it in person as well as online through a survey monkey that our business association sent out for, on our behalf, which was you know, a huge uh, vote of confidence. Um, and I will say, if you have the ability to collect data in person, you get a lot of information beyond your questions on the survey. We found out some really interesting things that we didn't know and wouldn't have known just from the online survey data, like um, the fact that we have a recycling program in existence for plastic bags that uh, a lot of business owners did not know about. Um, so that was something that we were able to educate them on. We also found out a lot about how important it was for moving to an alternative that was provided within East Town. Um, they really wanted to be able to keep business in East Town um, in terms of alternative sourcing. Next slide. So once you get your data, you may know, you know, you might have overwhelmingly in favor data like we did in East Town, and you might be able to move forward with drafting an ordinance. Um, that data will tell you what types of plastics you can target in your ordinance. Um, I personally was hoping we were going to go for straws and plastic and styrofoam takeout containers. I wanted it all banned, but the data was not supportive of that at the time. Um, you also can identify any businesses that are really going to have a hard time with it. The timing that uh, works for, for everyone. Farron suggested three months, but he also mentioned that a lot of Places have used longer um, on-ramps. We did six months based on the inventory data we got from our businesses um, regarding their backstock. Um, exemptions, definitions, all of these things are uh, data points that you can more easily identify in the, using that data that you collect. Uh, next slide. And then a couple things about drafting your ordinance. So once you have that data, you present it um, in Easttown, that was when we got the green light from our Board of Supervisors to go ahead and submit a first draft. Uh, know your township type. There's a bunch of different township types, and you want to model your ordinance language accordingly. So we um, we had to wait for someone. We didn't have to wait, but it helped that uh, West Goshen went ahead of us because we were able to model some of our opening language for the ordinance around the language that they used. Um, it just saves time when it gets to the township solicitor. Um, if you have that language in order, our township, township solicitor said that they barely had to touch our language because it was, it was right. It was um, in line with everything else that was on the books. So that's time and money um, that you're saving the township if you, you know, just take that extra step and make sure you've crossed that Cross that T. Um, as Farron said, there's a ton of good information out there for sample model ordinance language on Penn Environments Toolkit. You can also just ask the people around you um, if they've got information they're willing to share. Everyone I've met in this process has been more than happy to share their resources, experience, their contacts. Um, we're all trying to do the same thing, so please feel free to reach out. And make sure you have good supporting information to back you up when you go in front of your decision makers. Um, you may encounter members of the public or you know, decision makers that aren't fully convinced and you wanna have your stuff in line um, ready to present your arguments. Next slide. So once you, uh, you know, pass your ordinance, uh, congratulations. And then, you know, you need to figure out how you're going to get the community on board. Um, this might be where you have to do some education. So we did education ahead of and then after the ordinance. Um, we did residential, you know, background information. We had Maurice Sampson come out from Clean Water Action in Philadelphia. He came out and told us about the impacts of single-use plastics on the environment, both locally and globally, um, and just talk about, you know, their prevalence and the alternatives that are available. And that was a really well attended um, lecture that we had provided. And then following the ordinance, we set up something that was a little bit more tailored to 
businesses and was it more of a Q&A, um, Jim and Farron, who are both on here tonight, they came out and helped uh, present some information about, again, some background material as well as how this has rolled out in Westchester Borough. And then we provided some information specific to East Town's ordinance for uh, business owners. And again, that was a pretty successful event. So that might be something you need to think about at some point in the implementation uh, component of this. Next slide. So the other thing that was um, kind of unique to East Town is we did get that grant from the Solid Waste Authority right after we passed the ordinance in June. Um, we used the money that we were awarded to buy reusable tote bags to be given out to residents ahead of the ordinance effective date. Um, so those bags are something we designed with our township businesses. Um, again, you know, we were trying to keep things local because that had been stressed to us by them. Um, and then we were handing those out at township events ahead of the ordinance going into effect in January. Um, we put we stuffed them with materials that we had created and just um, were on hand at a bunch of different events to get the word out and just answer any questions that came along. Um, additionally, we did a lot of a lot of press in our township newsletters um, on our social media. We have an e-newsletter specific to the EAC, and we just put a lot of time into putting material out there that would answer any ex um, existing questions. Next slide. And then this is just an overview of the web page we put together specific to our ordinance. So. Um, on this page, this is on our EAC webpage on the township website. Um, we have we have the full text of the ordinance listed here, as well as we put together a local vendors list. Again, our businesses really wanted to be able to rely on each other for both paper and reusable tote bags. And so we, we went around and gathered up uh, the businesses that might be able to assist them, and we put them all here. We created the official notice, uh, which is a PDF that's downloadable and printable that's available here. We also printed them out on hard cardstock um, and made them available at the township for businesses to pick up for their windows. We did a point of sale sign, which is like a business card sized sign for uh, credit card machines. Uh, we saw those used, I believe it like Wegmans, um, and we thought those were really effective. And then last, we did a frequently asked questions, um, which is geared towards both community members as well as the business community. Um, and this, from what we've heard, has been pretty useful for people. All right, last slide. So the big uh, takeaways here are just, you need dedicated people willing to see this through. Um, some people are, are really good at going out and getting that survey data and talking to people. Other people are really good at getting into the weeds of writing an ordinance, uh, find what people are interested in, and then utilize them there. Um, set realistic goals and expectations. Again, I was really hoping to go for the whole thing, and we we weren't able to support that at the time. So we enacted what we could, and we are hoping to amend uh, for straws and styrofoam later this year. Um, be prepared to present at any time. I found myself one-on-one uh, -on -one with a supervisor in a nail salon of all places and actually was able to really share some, some insight onto why we were doing this and why the data supported it, um, which was you know a conversation I wasn't ready for, but it, it actually ended up being really beneficial, she told me later. Um, and then do not be afraid to ask for help. Um, we're all going after the same thing and um, we're all happy to help. And my contact information is here on the last uh, slide. Sam, if you just go to the last one, my information's there. So please feel free free to reach out. I'm happy to help. Thank, thank you very much, Kara. I'm going to ask that Zach um, give a couple of comments and maybe Ashley, and then we'll open everything up for questioning. So Zach. Yep. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, my name is Zach Davis. I'm with the Upper Marion EAC. And as many of you are probably familiar, Upper Marion is home to the King of Prussia Mall, as well as a pretty significant commercial presence that utilize and probably go through more single use plastic bags in most regions across Pennsylvania and maybe even the country. And I'll, I'll say that 
I'm lucky to have a group of five supervisors who are incredibly supportive of the EAC and especially single use plastic vans, um, which we're marketing as plastic pollution reduction, um, just to kind of combat any issues people may have with the term single use. Um, and we've been working on this actually since prior to preemption back in 2018 or 2019, uh, right when Narberth passed the first ban in the region, we were working actually with them and we're going to, you know, had the groundwork laid to pass an ordinance and then the state budget came out and kind of squashed all of our plans. So this has kind of been on the back burner for several years for Upper Marion and we're finally slated to pass it with probably a significant margin, probably 5-0 in the next month or so. Um, but just a comment on the King of Prussia Mall, as well as the commercial presence. We, we've been working pretty closely with the mall management, which is owned by Simon Properties, and they own a number of properties in the region, including the Plymouth Meeting Mall, as well as some of the Philadelphia Premium Outlets. And we've also been working with our King of Prussia Business Improvement District. And to be honest, we were pretty skeptical at first, and we're a little scared you know, thinking they were going to push back. But the responses that we've got is pretty overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, from the King of Prussia Business Improvement District, I've met with the chair person of that several times, and they manage and oversee a nonprofit network of a lot of the businesses in Upper Marion. And verbatim, the chair just said, just pass it and all the businesses will be fine with it. And for King of Pru and the King of Prussia Mall Management, they already have an implementation plan in place. They have already seen that this is coming in the pipeline. They've had an implementation pro uh, plan in place for about six months to a year now. So I just want to tell anybody who has Simon properties or big businesses in their community, due to the changing landscape in our region and in the country, they probably have implementation plans in place already. Uh, the the more difficult thing that we think we'll face down the road, and I think we'll have to combat this with education, and I do have to give props to Kara, as well as West Goshen. I think Ashley's on here from West Goshen. I've used your websites as definitely guides and inspiration for Upper Marion, and it's definitely what I'm going to go for um, when we roll it out in the education of our community, but I think we're gonna to need to work a little bit more closely with the mom and pop shops and the small businesses just to make sure that they aren't left behind and they aren't the ones, you know, feeling the brunt of any of the, you know, potential fines or implementation process. So we'll hold a decent amount of town halls and information sessions, you know, coordinate with our other boards. We have an economic community development committee as well as the library board. Our farmer's market will assist in rolling it out as well as applying for grants to you know, fund educational material and marketing material. Um, but I guess the bottom line is the mall and Simon Properties has actually been pretty supportive of everything. And if you have similar big businesses or you know, large malls in your area, don't be afraid of just going to their management or having your supervisors or you know, council members talk to the management and you know, kind of come up with a path forward because chances are they already have an implementation plan in place and ready to fire away once the ban comes. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Ashley, do you have any comments? Sure, yeah, just following up. I mean, you both had a lot of really great information to share. Um, so I'm a vice chair of the West Goshen Township Board of Supervisors. We're like the second largest township in the county. So we have a population of about 28,000 people. We passed our ban successfully. Um, it was December 2021, 5-0 uh, vote. We established RSAC in 2020. So right before COVID sort of took over and we started meet, meeting virtually, but we were really lucky that our sustainability committee is, I, to sort of echo what Kara was saying, you have to have some really committed people to get involved. And I give a lot of the credit to how this went to our sustainability committee. Um, but they, you know, regularly updated the board on, on where we were in the process. We were looking actively at Westchester's ordinance. I mean, Westchester and Narberth and Philadelphia really led the charge with this whole thing. So I had reached out to members of Westchester and also a woman who worked in the sustainability office in Philadelphia. And she came out and gave a presentation to our board 
and really talked about some of the challenges that Philadelphia was experiencing. And there actually were a lot of them. Um, and they've had to amend their ordinance a couple of times. That actually prevented us from making the same mistakes that they had made. And we originally, you know, the whole idea was exactly the blown extrusion process, right? So they can't get around. We didn't want a thickness in our ordinance. We worked with our solicitor. We decided not to charge a fee, we just all out ban. Um, but even so, we had to re-amend. So we're about, sorry, so let me back up. Our ordinance went into effect on Earth Day of 2022. So we gave people and businesses about five months to comply. And during that time, we had business workshops, which none of our businesses showed up to. We hosted two workshops for businesses and no one came. Um, but we really, we put a list of our businesses together. We sent out letters, um, some of the things that Kara had shared on the website. So our sustainability committee actually designed the little flyer that you saw. We put out um, QR codes for people. We put it in our newsletter. People were really excited. We had also done a preliminary survey and got an overwhelming response of people that were supportive. So we felt confident that we were moving in the right direction. Um, but sort of what I was saying is even since then, there's been one major retailer, which I don't know if I'm <laughs> supposed to identify, but it's a major retailer that's in many of our districts and townships that just has been very difficult in um, complying with this ban because they are using the excuse of a multi, you know, reusable plastic that is created to be used 175 times before it's recycled, right? So we actually, even though we thought we skirted that, had to go back in and change something again. So as far as enforcement goes, we've had a very, we've had a lot of success with enforcement. We had a couple of smaller businesses reach out to ask for um, an exemption, which really they had to prove a hardship to our sustainability committee first, which they really were not able to do when so many other small, you know, mom and pop shops were complying because like you, Zach, we were concerned about that as well um, because we didn't want those to be the ones that, you know, were suffering because of this. But really, I have to tell you, we have not had a lot of pushback for the most part. I mean, Acme, I went in there a few days after the ban went into effect and I talked with the manager there and he said that some people were kind of, you know, annoyed as you can probably imagine that some people will be. But for the most part, um, that's the grocery store that I regular now. And if someone forgets their bag, they're literally walking out with a cart full of stuff that they have to put in by hand into their trunk, but there's no plastic. And so, I mean, we've had great success Ongoing enforcement, it's an ongoing thing. You know, so we have people, we have staff at our township that handle that, that it's part of their job description now to follow up with enforcement and send out, you know, warning letters and we have fines and we have a whole process that we go through, but we've been very successful. And so thank you for letting me share. Fabulous, thank you, Ashley. Do we have any questions? Oh, uh, Logan. Yeah. Hi, um, Ashley. You said that you just banned them instead of doing a fee. What? Um, how are you? Is that is that correct? First of all. Yes, we don't. Yeah. And and so what? Um, you banned plastic. What about paper bags? Are they have stores found that they are being just asked to substitute the plastic, the foregone plastic, with paper? Yeah, so part of what the outreach that we did with businesses was to sort of like Kara had, had mentioned, we gave a, a vendor's list of alternative products that they might be able to give out to their customers. We also um, banned plastic straws in our ordinance, so I should have mentioned that. Like Westchester, we did plastic bags and plastic straws. Um, it's up to each individual business owner what they would like to do. I know that grocery stores will give out paper bags for free. Um, other stores will come up with different kinds of like there's some mesh bags that I, our dollar store gives out. It's like a fabric bag and they charge like 20 cents for that. So we kind of left it up to the businesses to see how they wanted to handle that. But we don't have a fee. I'd be in, really interested in seeing and this isn't meant to critique you by any means. You know, I think 
these bills are all really hard to get through in general. And um, whatever you need to do, I think it, in many cases is, is good. So don't take this as a critique. I'm really just curious. Um, we had a lot. Uh, oh, by the way, Logan Weldy uh, pronounced he, him, and, I, and I'm from Clean Air Council in Philadelphia. Um, and so we were very concerned with two things for not, we don't have a fee. Uh, which is which wasn't ever meant to be in Philadelphia. It was always meant to be a fee. That was um, the mayor would not. He said he would not allow it to go through if there was a fee attached to it. So, um, but we were very concerned with businesses having to make the choice of either charge and look like the bad person um, or give it away for free and just absorb that increase much much higher increase in cost um, than plastic bags um, into their cost of goods sold or, or, you know, figure out a way to make up for that loss. So um, there were, there were, those were two reasons in there. We didn't want the business to be the per bad person. Um, and we also were worried about the increased cost for businesses because, you know, the bottom line is someone is, most people are just going to say, oh, I, you don't have plastic. Just give me the paper. That's free. What, what It's free. You know, I don't care. So I'd be interested in, in, in just understanding, did you guys discuss either of those? And is there going to be like an ongoing conversation with businesses to see how they're handling it? And, you know, one thing that I think Farron talked about, you don't want confusion in a bill. So if one store is charging 20 cents, the other store is not, there's going to be confusion. It's not written into the bill, but the lack of speaking to it is going to confuse consumers. Confusing consumers gets businesses into um, a very bad position because they just get yelled at. Um, you know, if it's 20 cents at one store, but it was free across the street, the person's going to say, why are you charging 20 cents? No one else is. You know, they're going to look like the bad person. And the end of the day, we did not, that, that was just a really bad outcome. So again, I, I started this with, I know this isn't a critique and I know it sounded like one. I, I just, I'm just talking through it, you know, uh, um, with you. And and, um, and bottom line is, great bill. I love it. Um, and I'm just curious about about that aspect. So are you looking for, for an answer from me on that? Well, if you don't have an answer about, so I guess what I was wondering is, did you guys have that conversation with any businesses where they were worried they were going to either look bad at charging something or have to absorb a cost that, that they weren't expecting? Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, so we were very communicative with businesses. We gave them the opportunity to sort of voice their concerns before any of this went into effect. Um, and they really did not have many questions. They didn't bring that up. I will tell you from my own personal experience and from the feedback from residents that I have heard and from businesses alike, which there has not been much, is that I don't find that it's a confusing situation. Um, and we're also lucky that we're right next to the borough because a lot of the people that live in our township are, you know, we sort of move through our two municipalities, right? And so I think a lot of people in West Goshen consider themselves from Westchester. And it's a, we're lucky that it's sort of a very progressive place. And so there hasn't really been a lot of point, like finger pointing at businesses, because I think for the most part where we live, people understand that this is just the right thing to do. And if a business decides not to offer bags because they're too expensive, I think for the most part, people respect that. And it's really just trained people to bring their own bags everywhere, you know? So whether they're going to the grocery store and then they have to make a stop at Wawa for something different, or they have to go to, you know, a, a Rite Aid or they have, you know, and they're running errands, it's like everywhere is banned. So they bring their own bag at least where we are. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, that, that was really helpful. And again, I, I wasn't be trying to be critical or, or me. Not at all. Not at all. I totally get your question. All right, good. And your answer was, was really helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I think it highlights the fact that every municipality is different. What works in Philadelphia does not always translate well to another municipality that the people the mindset the businesses everything so so i really appreciate your uh your feedback there thanks that's a good point logan and elaine you've had your hand up quite a bit well if i could just add something 
um, on Philadelphia real quick. Logan, I think you you sort of buried the lead with Philadelphia in that we've been seeing problems with enforcement and with business yeah. compliance in Philly, where if they did have a fee on paper bags, it would have gone much smoother in terms of implementation. Enforcement would be better across the board and the whole process would have been better. And in removing the fee last minute in Philly, that's what caused a lot of the problems with their implementation, their rollout, and their enforcement. And so we, we've been working for a while to, to change that, but um, it'll take at least a couple more months before that happens. Elaine. Can you hear me? I unmuted it. Okay. So I, if this may be a small question, but I've, ha I've met with over 75 businesses already. Because uh, we're in, I'm the chair of the EAC in Newtown Township, and we're just preparing uh, to introduce um, the ordinance. We already have a resolution that no one followed. But then again, I don't think we did a good educational process to our businesses. But I had two questions today. I know they seem small, but to these businesses, they were big. Uh, how about, especially with King of Prussia Mall uh, or with dress shops, I have, we have a number of businesses that uh, sell a lot of dresses, long dresses, gowns, and they said, we can't comply because there is nothing out there to cover our, our very long dresses and gowns. Do you find that whoever was at King of Prussia uh, or Ferran, have you had that? And we also, one other question, if someone can jump in there, we are going to try, we may not be successful, but we may be going for the utensils. And we had uh, one of our businesses, everybody knows two guys, called me today to get a heads up and said, we can't do this. Uh, there are no alternatives out there, which we know there's alternatives, but how did anybody else approach that when they say they're, um, uh, they must purchase from their corporation? And if their corporation doesn't have the alternative, what do they do? Uh, well, was tackling, I guess, the utensil. Five guys. <laughs> five guys. <laughs> um, tackling the, the utensil part first. Um, we, we recommend the same policy for utensils that we do straws, where rather than an outright ban, you do a customer request policy where businesses aren't able to just have buckets of utensils sitting out. They can't just automatically give you a plastic utensil or a plastic straw. You have to take that extra step to ask for them. And studies have shown it's been pretty effective at reducing the overall use of straws, of utensils, and that way, people who do need the utensils, like the disabled community or the elderly community, and then also for businesses where they might not be able to procure non-plastic utensils, though I haven't had that concern come up before, that that's a new one for me, um, that way it, it's not a concern in that case. So if you do an on-request policy, that should address that problem for them. But how about inside the restaurant where they're only using plastic? Right. They they wouldn't be able to just automatically provide a plastic utensil to someone. Someone would have to ask for it. Even um, if... They'd still be allowed to have them. They just can't give them out automatically. And that that just extra step helps with that. Okay. Um, as far as the, the dresses go, some ordinances do have exemptions for dry cleaner bags um, because some dry cleaners have had issues complying I'm not fully sold on that exemption. I don't think it's entirely necessary because there are some paper alternatives, but then there are also reusable alternatives. There are plenty of reusable garment bags or dry cleaner options that you could bring your clothing to a store in and get it back. Or for the dress shop, they could find a longer reusable covering that people could then return to the store. So there are options for exemptions. I always caution against just giving an exemption because someone hasn't found an alternative because part of this ordinance is to encourage creativity and to get people to find the reusable options to move away from the single use one and to create these solutions. So if we just give people an easy out, then we're kind of taking away that creativity. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if I could maybe interject for the case of the King of Prussia Mall, 
Um, as our ordinance is written, we're kind of using the model that uh, Penn Environment has drafted as well as um, one of the solicitors in our Southeast PA region who's written a decent amount of these ordinances. And right now it does have an exemption for those long garment bags. Um, the interesting thing is, though, in my presentation recently to the Board of Supervisors, we have uh, a few older supervisors and they were just like, why don't we just ban those too? You know, back when I used to get dry cleaning when I was younger, they would just put it in a paper bag and that was that. Like there was no plastic or anything. So I was actually a little bit surprised that they wanted to go a step further than what I was thinking because I thought that was even going to be a tough sell to them. And here they are coming with, you know, why don't we just ban that? Why don't we just, it was a little surprising. They kept like recommending we just keep banning more stuff. And I was like, well, I don't know, six months ago, a couple of you were worried about just, you know, regular grocery store bags. And now you're telling me you want to ban, you know, come or uh, fruit bags, produce bags, uh, dry cleaning bags and all that. And um, yeah, it was a bit surprising, but as, as of now, that's unfortunately exempted in our ban, but we may look to you know, kind of evaluate that in the future. I know there are some alternatives right now, um, but I'm just not sure how well the business community knows about them. And again, that's partly on us to educate the community. Um, but I think I, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew at first, and we can, you know, kind of tackle that later. And then additionally, I, I did forget to mention that in our ordinance, we're looking to ban plastic bags, polystyrene, food containers, plastic utensils and plastic straws. So the case um, that kind of Farron just uh, laid out is we, we at right now, the plan is to ban plastic utensils. That's one piece that we're still waiting on feedback from some of the businesses in our community. That's the one piece we're not 100% sure that it's going to be an easy sell, even though we know there are alternatives that they can purchase. And we plan to have an extensive list of alternatives that they can purchase for their businesses. Um, so we're kind of going back and forth in between by request only and keeping them all behind the counters or just an outright ban on all plastic utensils. Thank you. Logan? Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment on that. Also, those were two good things to bring up. We did write the Philadelphia bill originally to ban in, to include a ban on um, garment um, plastic bags from the dry cleaner. And along the way, we took it out. Uh, Squilla, who was the, the, the lead uh, on the bill for city council, just didn't want to have that battle. Um, we, he, he thought it was a good idea to keep it in, but it just, there were so many battles uh, and he thought taking that out would eliminate a pretty big chunk of, of the opposition. Um, I think people just sometimes can't get their head around the fact that we lived without these things in the past. Like I think Zach, you mentioned the paper bags. I mean, we did live without plastic everywhere uh, in the past. So as Farron said, you know, there are alternatives. I would really push the, the least amount of exemptions um, and carve outs, the better. So keep the bill just as simple and basic as possible and really try and push hard against it. There are alternatives to, to almost everything that we're using these superfluous plastic things for. Um, we just need to find it. And so I rarely disagree with Farron. I, I think in the past I have said this before though, I am really against the, uh, the, the bill, um, the, the mechanism of on demand. It just, it was a, absolute disaster in New York City with the plastic straws. The, the stores, there's, it's very difficult to enforce it. Um, at a store, uh, you mentioned Five Guys, where was that the, the place that, that only has, um, so if a customer eats in, the only option is plastic. There's no, I mean, the, the store is just going to get so frustrated. The, the consumers are going to get so frustrated. If, it's like a game of like, who's on first? Do you want utensils? Well, yeah, I want utensils. You've got to ask for them. Okay, give me the, you know, it's just, it becomes a weird game. Um, either ban them and make the store figure it out. There are metal things. You remember, we all <laughs> used metal things in the past. Um, it, it's just crazy to me that a store as big as that can't figure it out. They will figure it out, believe me. They will figure it out. Uh, the store, um, they're probably gonna save money, by the way, by, by you passing a bill that bans them giving plastic forks and knives out to people. Um, 
at the end of the day, these are all business friendly bills because we are saving businesses money. Um, they just don't know it yet. <laughs> um, but um, I, I would not get, give that exemption and I would not do on demand it, in this, all the bills that I've studied on it. Um, and maybe Farron, Farron, you and I should probably sit down at some point and just discuss this because it has been an, you know, a topic you and I have discussed before or uh, disagreed with about before. Uh, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, either charge for them or ban them. Um, yeah, yeah. I just have, oh, am I muted? Is no, you're good. You're good. Okay. So it's very interesting because, you know, I sort of agree with you and not that I'm disagreeing with, with uh, Farhan, but you go into Whole Foods and they use, <laughs> I saved one, they use um, a product called Preserve. I mean, it's right here. World Centric has it. Repurpose has them. I mean, there are so many alternatives. The only problem, I don't know if anybody can help me with this. I have called these companies and because I want to walk in there armed with information that, okay, this is how much your plastic costs, but this is how much your alternative costs. I don't want to get anybody off guard. And nobody will talk to me because I don't own a business. So my next step is I'm going to try to uh, partner with some businesses and have them as the representative. Did anybody else do utensils? Uh, because our board of supervisors, two of them, want to go for the utensils. So anybody else can help me on this? <laughs> well, um, one thing, and just to jump in quickly, have a plan. If you're going to use compostable as the the alternative have a plan because do you guys compost no uh no. You, you, so no. compostable materials become trash if they're not composted so you're not you're not making a big difference in in many ways i mean I, look I, I agree there's market dynamics in play here and making stores switch in some ways is, is better than others but just switching to compostable utensils in many ways does not help the problem it increases cost to businesses and it just becomes trash so and i see tamala if i probably said your name wrong said it's also hazardous yeah there are a lot of issues with compostable so be careful that's not the solution um in many people's minds um, it's maybe even a bigger headache um so okay very good point uh jim has had his hand up and then ashley and then kara yeah, hi guys. Uh, real quick, in I live in Westchester Borough, and we've had an, uh, a ban and a, a, a paper fee of ten cents uh, for a couple of years now. And one thing that our borough council punted on was enforcing the fee on takeout items. And I'd love to hear any uh, uh, success stories along those lines. And the reason why is the business community pushed back, saying that the takeout apps like you know, delivery apps, uh, we're not uh, able to handle the added 10 cents to show the 10 cents because that was part of the ordinance is to show it on the receipt as a fee to try to discourage um, the single use uh, usage. Um, so uh, as it stands right now, we still plastic uh, bags are banned, but the uh, charging of the 10 cents for takeout items um, or delivery is uh, is exempted. Ashley? Yeah, I just wanted to agree with you, Logan. I think that you have to either ban the straws or let them have them because enforcing that, it's going to be very difficult. We have an outright ban on straws, but we did work into our ordinance into the actual language that they must be able to accommodate somebody with a disability. That is the only exception. That's it. Not if you just want a straw. And they've, I mean, we have a lot of major takeout places and they've all been able to comply. I mean, and just to speak to um, Elaine, to speak to your question, you know, partnering with businesses, things like that. I understand why you want to do that because in a perfect world, they would want to partner with, with us, with, EACs, SACs, and the government, right? But I think that in many cases, at least from what I've found here, is that 
this unfortunately just sort of becomes the way it is and you have to comply with it. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? And like, not to be like a hard line person, but that's just the way it is. And some of them are going to be angry about it. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, that was our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Kara? Um, just to add to the compostable thing, we, we have a couple industrial composters who service our township um, at, for like, uh, we have a curbside collection for a lot of people. And then we also offer one at our library and they actually have both, both of the um, companies that do that for us have said, you cannot put those compostable utensils in the buckets. They're not breaking down in their piles. Yeah. Um, so it's just, just another thing to think about. And then to Ashley's point, um, one thing we were trying to discuss with our business association, since they were a pretty willing partner with us, um, was to do some like bulk ordering for the township businesses, um, to get them together. And then they could bulk order paper bags or, um, like they could do another round of these reusable tote bags with the the township seal on it or something they came up with. Um, and as far as I know, that has not gone anywhere, but that might be an option you could put forward to a couple of businesses if they're looking for ways to source items and not seeing them in their own um, providers lists. So it might be something that works. Do we have any more questions? Ashley, your hand is still up. <laughs> any more questions? I have one. Um, this isn't exactly about plastic, but it's about styrofoam. Um, we have a community kitchen here that I help out at, and I asked them if they could find an alternative to styrofoam takeout containers. And they did look for them, but they said it was four times more expensive to get any kind of alternative and they couldn't, they didn't think the board would approve that. Has anybody had any experience with trying to get rid of styrofoam takeout containers? Yeah, it's been done a couple times in Pennsylvania. So far bans on uh, polystyrene, it, in the ordinance it's called uh, polystyrene foam uh, food service products usually. Um, but it's been done in Solbury Township in Bucks County, Ambler, Montgomery County, Euclid Township, and then I believe Tradifrin also included styrofoam in theirs. Um, and it is the cheapest option, styrofoam, because it's made of plastic, and plastic is usually the cheapest option for any of these containers. But um, there hasn't been too much pushback in terms of cost of alternatives to polystyrene, um, in the same way that there has been with uh, paper versus plastic costs. And that's another bonus of the fee is that retailers keep it and it helps them transition from plastic bags to paper bags. But there hasn't been too much pushback with the polystyrene bands. They're usually fairly straightforward. It is an extra cost businesses have to swallow, but um, there are ways either they can partner with other businesses or there might be a way to do a reusable takeout container program. Um, we've talked to some businesses that are doing reusable containers. Um, Tiffin is a good chain in the Philly suburbs that does this very well. It saved them a ton of money on their operations because they have hard plastic containers that they track. They give them out with their takeout. People return it to them. If you don't return it, they charge you. Um, but they, I think last time I checked with them, they'd only had one container not get returned to them and then they wash them. So that's certainly an alternative that businesses can do. It just requires training people differently. Um, but other than that, I think it's, if, if you have the ability to pass a ban on polystyrene, you certainly should because they're horrific. They can't be recycled. Um, and we have better alternatives. Logan. Thank you, Farron. Logan. Yeah, uh, I would suggest um, doing it, first of all. Um, but um, the costs are going to be a big, it's going to be a big difference, uh, especially as more and more municipalities throughout the country ban certain things, 
the alternative price, the alternative products prices are going to go up just because the demand. Um, so you're, you're going to get that. Um, my suggestion would be that you, the municipality, um, and I've mentioned the bad person before, um, you know, you guys take that role on and help the businesses out by mandating a fee. Uh, but before you do that, investigate with your health department in Philadelphia, uh, Nick Esposito and I worked on this before um, we were going to work on another bill for styrofoam, which is hopefully coming in, in Philly. Um, but we made sure through the health department that the stores could take people's reusable containers. So, you know, all of these bills, they are behavior modification bills. So check with your health department and say, hey, do you allow businesses to take people's containers? Like, for example, at Starbucks, can someone give their mug and you fill and the Starbucks employee can fill it up uh, at a store uh, at a restaurant? Can someone hand in their own container? And what's the process for that? And then put in the bill that there's a fee for the for the new you know single use product, but have a sign that says you're allowed to bring your own container. Uh, you know that that's ultimately the overall goal is to transition us from a single use to a circular economy. Um, and that, um, yeah, so uh, that, uh, Fer Ferenc note in here, Tiffin got the Philly health code changed to allow them. Yeah, so you, I would work with your public uh, health department on this, but you are putting your business in a very difficult position. If you're getting, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but businesses costs are going to skyrocket if all of these things no plastic bags, no styrofoam, no utensils, all these things add up and they're a large part of businesses costs. So work with the health department and then implement a fee that the businesses must charge. Uh, then they're not going to look bad to their customers and then um, offer that our alternative. Great. Thank you, Logan. Anybody else have any questions? I don't see any. We will be sending the recording out. Farron will get a list of um, the registrants uh, and we'll also send out uh, Farron's toolkit. And I have some other uh, information from Beyond Plastics. So, and uh, Tracy Viola from uh, Tradiferin sent in her um, PowerPoint and she's uh, letting everyone have a copy of her PowerPoint. So that will come to you as well. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming out for this meeting and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. How do you get, how do you, how do you leave? Yeah. Thank you, Farron. Was that excellent? How do you? Leave? Yeah. Thanks for having me. We hope to do this again in other counties. <laughs> yes. But this was the first test of counties. And uh, I personally invited uh, every township. So um, hopefully. And there's Tamla. Yeah, it looks like quite a few people um, came that I, you know, invited. So that was awesome. Yeah. A lot of um, people from the north, north. Pittsburgh and um, up in that area. That's good. What yeah. what municipality are you at, Tamla? I'm in uh, Carlisle Borough. Okay. Move past plastics. That's Tamla. Um. Yeah, I'm going to send. I'm going to send everybody out um, the resources that we have. So we should be all set. Awesome. All right. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.